you mentioned that you think the mafia underestimated Giuliani. Why? Why do you think that? So were the mafia involved in car crime? Oh yeah. Another one of your brilliant quotes on in the book is um, the Mulberry Street again. Wise guys littered the block, shaking hands and kissing cheeks like Disney characters greeting small children at the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> Vic Ferrari, welcome to the show. How are you? How you doing, my friend from across the pond? How's it going? <laughs> it's going very well, thank you very much. Lovely spring day, so uh, yeah, all good. How's things with you? I'm doing great. Uh, living in sunny Florida, just got another puppy. She's sucking the life out of me, but we'll get her there where she needs to be. <laughs> I've been there. I've been to both, actually, Florida and the pup- puppy sucking the life out of me, but yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, how Would you like to explain, like, who you are, and uh, we'll get cracking. Sure. My name is Vic Ferrari. I'm a 20-year retired member of the New York City Police Department, born and raised in New York City, grew up in the Bronx, always wanted to be a New York City police officer and detective. I grew up in the 70s watching the Rockford Files, uh, the Seven Ups, the French Connection, all cop shows on television, so I knew at an early age what I wanted to do with myself to my parents' chagrin because my parents wanted me to go to college. I would have none of it. I graduated high school at 18 years old. There was a gap until I could be hired by the NYPD, so it was kind of like, catch me if you can. I cleaned airplanes. I unloaded trucks for UPS. I worked in supermarkets. I was an exterminator for a cup of coffee. You name it, I did it. By the time I was 21, I got hired by the NYPD, went through the police academy, went on to a wonderful 20-year career. I worked in a lot of different units. I was a patrolman. In the South Bronx, I worked in a DUI unit, which I absolutely despised. I worked in a plainclothes detail called anti-crime, where you're going after pickpockets, burglaries, robberies, and progress. I worked in the Manhattan North Narcotics Division as an investigator doing search warrants and buy and bust operations in Spanish Harlem in the early 90s. And then my last 10 years, I was a detective in the NYPD's Auto Crime Division. So anything with chop shops, stolen vehicles, exporting of stolen vehicles out of the country, changing vehicle identification numbers on stolen cars for resale, um, some organized crime cases. And uh, after my 20th year, I decided it was time to pack it in. I retired and moved down to sunny Florida where I got into writing. I've written a series of behind-the-scenes NYPD books. They're available on Amazon. And to promote my books, I started a podcast, which is called NYPD Through the Looking Glass Podcast, where I bring on retired NYPD members and reformed gangsters and criminals to talk about their story. Is that all? (laughs) There's more, but we'll just leave. We'll get to that. Great stuff. Can you describe your childhood, please? Yeah, um, dad was a butcher, mom was a housewife, grew up on a row house on the side of the Cross Bronx Expressway. You could hit it with a baseball. Uh, I grew up Catholic. We were not holy rollers. By the time I was uh, probably about 14 years old, I went to public school for my first uh, primary school and then middle school, public school, and we're sitting around the dinner table one night. My father says, um, next year you're going to Catholic high school. I says, what? We don't even go to church. And he goes, listen, you're a clown. And if I send you to public school, you're going to be a bigger (laughs) clown. So pick a high school that's run by the men in black. And I didn't want it. And it was probably the best thing to ever happen to me because I went to an all-boys Catholic high school, kicking and screaming. But I needed that discipline. uh, And it was probably the best. I didn't realize it at the time, but the NYPD and Catholic high school were two of the best things to ever happen to me. My dad was a butcher. He worked uh, worked for a wholesale meat provider, which unbeknownst to me – was owned by organized crime. And when I was a little boy, I would go to work with him. And this is before OSHA laws and regulations. So here I am, 12, 13, 14 years old, making sausage and chop meat in, in these industrial machines, right, where you could probably lose your arm. And again, it was run by organized crime. So my my beginnings to, to realizing about organized crime was one day I'm in this wholesale meat place and my father tells me, listen, Vic, go up to the second floor and get something. I don't know what it was. And as I walked up three concrete steps. I go to make a left, and as I go go more go to the other set of steps, a man comes tumbling down the concrete stairs, and he's screaming and yelling, and falls to the bottom of the pile. And he looked like he had Parkinson's, like his hands were all broken. And the guy is just looking at me, help me, help me. And these two big Italian guys, let's just say Rocco and Vinny, come walking down the stairs, and they're laughing. 
And I'm just standing there looking at this guy who's pleading for help, right? I'm like 13 years old. And they go, oh, Vic, don't worry about him. He's an old friend of ours. I'm like, friend. They pick this guy up and he's like, help me, help me. And I watched them. They carried him out to the front of the store and they threw him out with the garbage, right? And they went back inside. So my dad's trimming steaks. I go running up to him like, dad, Rocco and Vito beat the crap out of this guy. And my father said, don't worry about it. Just, just keep working. I'll find out what happened. I said, all right. Later that night, my dad and I are driving home, and I bring it up again. What happened to that man? And my father said, Vic, some people will never learn. And I go, well, what do you mean some people will never learn? He goes, well, that guy's a shoplifter. He got caught last week boosting a couple of stakes, and they smacked him around, and they told him never come back. Today he came back in, and they caught him with a slab of ribs down his pants, so they brought him upstairs, broke his hands in a vice, and threw him down the stairs. He goes, he's not going to come back anymore. So I said, oh. And that was the last day I worked there because my father said, listen, I have to work here. You don't, and I don't want this life for you. My dad wasn't in organized crime. He just worked for a company that was owned by organized crime. So eventually he just basically it was, I worked for McDonald's. So I went from working in a wholesale meat provider doing all this dangerous stuff, and then I went to the corporate world of McDonald's. And that kind of opened my eyes that there was something going on in my neighborhood and around the people that my father had to work for. So were the mafia, like, entrenched in your area? Yeah. There was um, not as bad. At, like, the Bronx, it was around, but, like, the guys that you, you're going to have on and you have on, like, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, there's definitely were, were more of them, and it was more of a presence. In my neighborhood, uh, it was kind of divided up into territories. It wasn't like you'd see on television, like, a, a ton of social clubs. There was a handful of them where, you know, you'd have older gentlemen standing outside in suits or wife-beater T-shirts sitting around just talking. And there's a story in my book, Confessions of a Catholic High School Graduate, where um, I had to sell raffle tickets. And um, I didn't know any better. My friend says, well, go to the bars. I was, like, 14 years old. Go to the bars and sell these raffle tickets. I said, all right. So I go to this Italian-American social club, which it's a front. I didn't know. You know, the blacked out, smoked windows, right? I opened the door, and the light, it was so dark in there, like the light behind me was like a laser beam cutting through the smoke. And someone yelled, shut that fucking door. So I should have just left, but me being me, I stepped in. So I walked up to the bar, and the bartender goes, what do you want? Speak. And I says, I, I got to sell these raffle tickets. So he threw 20 bucks at me. So I handed him the books to, to fill out his name and address. And he goes, what's this? I go, well, I need your name and address. He goes, Ronald fucking Reagan. He goes, kid, listen, get out of here. So as I turn to leave, some guy pats me on the head and pinches my cheek. And this guy with like this gray hair like I got now, like a co-fuel with enough hairspray to burn a hole in the ozone layer. He pinches my cheek and he gives me 20. I go to hand him the book and he goes, don't worry about it, kid, just leave. So I'm walking outside, and I'm standing there with 40 bucks in my hand. Nobody wanted to sign the raffle tickets, which is unheard of. And I think I was telling you this earlier. Outside, we ha a meter maid came by, and he started writing all their car's tickets. So I walked back inside, and they said, didn't we tell you to get out of here? I go, well, the meter maid is writing your tickets. All these guys come running outside. They confront the meter maid. It's going back and forth. The next thing you know, the meter maid gets punched in the face. They take his ticket book and tear out the summonses that got their license plate numbers on it, and they take off in different directions. So I thought that was like the greatest thing in the world. I got 40 bucks. I sold my raffle tickets, and I watched a meter maid who were not very popular in New York get smacked around. So I go home that night, and my mother is thrilled they sell these raffle tickets. She's not asking where the money came from or who I sold them to. And uh, I went upstairs. And my father knows his son likes to take shortcuts. So my dad starts looking at the raffle ticket book, <laughs> and he sees my name. I put Victor Ferrari on all and on our address. So he yells. I come downstairs, and he thought I stole money to buy the raffle tickets. I go, no, Dad. I says, I went to this bar. He goes, you went to a bar? What are you doing at a bar? So I'm getting yelled at for that. And then he goes, where? And I explain to him where I went. And he goes, what are you kidding? Racketeers own that place. He goes, you're lucky somebody didn't get their, cut throat, their throat cut in front. He goes, that's it. No more with the raffle tickets. So my father was always pulling me out of the fire with these things like, like I was like a puppy. I would get involved in something. My father like, no, that's not for you. Get out of there. <laughs> what did your parents um, think about the mafia? And what did they, I take it they might have had a discussion with you about it. What did they say? Oh, all the time. I mean, what, the cat was out of the bag after I saw that guy get thrown down the stairs. 
You know what I mean? Because then I then I was fascinated by it. And it, it wasn't like today where I could go on my iPhone and my computer and look up stories about the mafia. And it wasn't like true crime John Road. But I went to the library. I might have picked up a couple of the very beginning books of whatever. That I didn't learn much. But my father had a friend that was kind of around it. He wasn't a gangster by far, but he was kind of around it. Like we would go to his house and there'd be like VCRs in boxes like we didn't have the money for a vcr like it was like this new technology he like he tell my father J -j take one and my father's like, no nah, nah, that's all right I don't like that. <laughs> you know <laughs> uncle joe said we could have, no you know what i mean we're, we're here to have dinner we're not here to, to trade vcrs so it was around um i i was fascinated by it because what happened is once i hit middle school Sports betting starts getting starts coming into middle school. So some of the mobsters' kids would were, were doing sports betting. Now I didn't know that was the mob, but then you start figuring it out. And then where they live and when their houses are a hell of a lot nicer than mine, and you walk in the house and there's plastic runners on the floor and the furniture's covered in plastic, and you know they they've got a brand new car every year. So I definitely saw there were things going on that were not unlike my lifestyle. So your parents then, so by the sound of it, your father, like, kind of kept them at arm's length, didn't want anything to do oh, with yeah. them, um, and he didn't want you to have anything to do with them. But did he respect them or tolerate them? Or he, I think my father, he never said, but I think my father looked at them as, like, a necessary evil, if that makes sense. I, I don't think he ever, to my knowledge, he had never had a reason other than his paycheck to utilize their services. My father didn't drink. My father didn't gamble. Um, my dad was a law-abiding citizen. So, but he, but he, I, I think he understood people that would go to them, if that makes any sense. It's kind of like um, there's things in life legal that we have no use for, but other people do. And I guess that's the way my father looked at it. Like, you know, you go by, if you don't drink and you go by a liquor store, you know, do you have disdain for the alcoholic that goes in there and buys it? You know what I mean? Like, my father would make comments like this guy got him, like, there'd be a news story about a guy found in a trunk in a car or something. And my father, well, well, that's what happens when you get too close to these people. You know, he, um, he didn't condemn it, but he certainly wanted really no part of it for him or his family. What would happen if I, or maybe an average Joe walked into a social club? Like a mob <laughs> social club. Okay, so it depends on the place, but say for argument's sake, you're a tourist. You're visiting from the UK, and for whatever reason, you want to try Bronx pizza. So you go into my neighborhood, and you go down Tremont Avenue somewhere, and you go to, back then, they don't exist anymore, but you go to a mob social club that, that's a front as a bar. You and your girlfriend have no idea. You're taking photos. It's obvious you're tourists. You're not cop. And you walk into the bar. Everybody's going to give you a dirty look. You might get told one of two things. Someone might say, sorry, friend, it's a private club. Oh, and you'll turn around and leave. If they don't go that route, you go to the bar and you'll say, um, I'll have a Bud Light. We don't have Bud Light. I'll have a Coors Light. We don't have Coors Light. Or if they do give you a Bud Light, that'll be $18. And you go, $18, private club. So they, they really, they'll leave a bad taste in your mouth that you're like, Oh, these guys are assholes. I'm never coming back there again. But basically what they're doing is in so many words telling you don't come back. What happened if I didn't pay for the? If I said I didn't want it? Too much money. They'd be happy you left and they would drink the beer. <laughs> That's the whole point what of the happen. exercise is just not to... They don't want you getting familiar with the place or hanging around. Mm. No, I get it. So was there, were there any um, sort of notable names? in your area, mob, mob names when you were growing up? Yeah, I mean, later on in life, I guess around the time I was a teenager, um, Vinny Gorgeous Bastiano was from my neighborhood. I never had any dealings with him, but I saw him around all the time. His base of operations wasn't far from where I grew up. I would see him around the neighborhood. You would hear things. You know what I mean? You would hear things, and, you know, people knew not to hang out in front of like one of his businesses that you know the kids knew better than that's not the place you want to hang around or mess with people because you're going to get a kick in your ass really hard and if you don't knock it off you, it might be worse but yeah he he was around my neighborhood 
interesting. So, well, how were you, what were you like at school, Vic? Were you a good kid, academically intelligent? In public school, I thought I was a genius. I was always in the top classes, and it's like anything in life, anything else in life, and based in little league or academics. Once you start going higher and higher up, you start realizing you're not as good as you you envisioned yourself to be. So yeah, I went from like a 90 student in in public school. The second I went to Catholic high school, the kids were just as smart as me, if not smarter. Puberty was kicking in. I discovered girls, so my grades went from the 90s to borderline passing student. I like to say that I did five and a half years of a four-year sentence of Catholic high school between detention and, and summer school. I went to summer school my first three years. It's I could not grasp math. I mean, I can do simple basic math, but as far as equations and fractions, it just, it killed me. Really? So your parents, you say that your mum wasn't, your mum wanted you to go to college in effect, who wants you to further your education. So were they both, like, your mum and your dad, happy with you joining the police? What were their thoughts on you joining the police? They weren't against it, but they wanted me to keep my options open. Um, they, they, there was that gap of two or three years before, from the time I graduated high school until the time I could become a member of the New York City Police Department. So while I was going to all these crazy jobs, like I'd leave the house with one job and come home later on with another job, they, they wanted to kill me because... They they were really upset with me because they, they had nothing against the New York City Police Department or me going into law enforcement, but they wanted me to keep my options open. I mean, they were once I passed the test and I was in the police academy and I was on my way, they were fine with it. But it was to get to that point they were really nervous about, was I going to be living in their basement for the rest of their lives? Why, why police? Why did you choose to go down the police, not the army or any other kind of... I I had no so, interest at the yeah. time of going to the military. My brother did. My brother went into the Marines, and then my brother went into the Department of Corrections. He worked on Rikers Island, and then he was a New York City police officer. He followed me into the police department. But I, like I said earlier, I always wanted to be a police officer. Growing up, watching all those television shows, like I, I there's a story in one of my books. I was probably the first. I think the first. PG movie, non-cartoon, my parents took me to see. I think it was Live and Let Die, I think 1973, Roger Moore, James Bond flick. And on the way to the movie theater, around the corner from our movie theater was a local police station. And my mother's walking me, and we're waiting for the light to change. And I see all those police cars, and I just break from my mother, run through traffic, and go to the police station. And my mother is screaming. And I'm looking in the police call window i'm looking at the cops and my mother's gonna beat the shit out of me for running away almost getting hit by a car right and the cops diffused my mother like no he's all right don't worry about like they calmed her down because she was pissed and then it became every time we went to the movie theater i was more interested in the police cars and what those guys were doing than the movie so and then when i worked in a gas station when the cops would come in for us to put in snow chains on the tires or I think we had some kind of we to fix flats on the police cars. There was a contract we had with them. I, I, I would pick their brain. I, I, was, I must have been the biggest pain in the ass because I would ask them everything. Their guns, the police academy. Like I, I was a sponge. I wanted to know everything about law enforcement as I could. It sounds like um, it was your calling. Oh, definitely. Like, Absolutely. So, so many people. Yeah. Well, so my high school. So them. my high school was a civil service. <laughs> unwittingly. My high school is a civil service academy. So my graduating high school class of 240 boys, or 250 boys, 40 from my year became NYPD police officers. And every wow. year, 30 to 50 people went into the NYPD. It was like a civil service academy. Really? So what was New York like? What, 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 age, what age were you? No, so not, what year did you um, start your policing? 1987. So what was New York City like in 1987? It's one of those things, when you're in it, it's not as bad as you think it is. And then if you take a step back and look at it, like, my neighborhood was okay. It was crime. But basically, the neighborhood policed itself, although the cops did get involved sometimes with things. But the outskirts of my neighborhood were rough. The South Bronx, I mean, the Bronx was burning in the 1970s. Crime was out of control. Um, New York City... 
So when I before I got hired, New York City was kind of a dump. I mean, it had slid into the bit into the abyss. They they came very close to declaring bankruptcy. There's a famous story where um, the mayor of New York, I think it was an Abe Beam at the time, went to Gerald Ford for funds for New York, and Ford told him no. When the front page of the New York uh, New Daily News said Ford in New York dropped dead, so there was graffiti, crime. I mean, in NYPD, when I got hired in 87, we were averaging 2,500 homicides a year. 2,500 people were murdered in New York City every year. On top of that, there were 150,000 stolen vehicles a year. So that's just to give you an idea of what was going on. And you, you ended up in auto crime, didn't you? Yeah, eventually. I, I was always a car guy. I grew up in a neighborhood where... There were a lot of car thieves, and then I worked at a gas station, so the car thieves were always blowing through our gas station with broken steering columns, uh, broken vent windows, looking to sell the car, looking to sell parts off the car, asking us to fix the car. So I knew what to look for with stolen cars, the look, um, what to look for to spot a stolen car. So once I went into patrol, I was always the guy getting involved in car chases and coming up with stolen cars. I remember one time uh, another cop said, I don't know where you grew up, he says, but, but he goes, you're like a magnet for these things. I says, yeah, I kind of know what I'm looking for. In your book, uh, NYPD Through the Left Looking Glass, Grand Theft Auto, I, I've just pulled out a quote and I have to ask you it. So your quote was, growing up in a neighborhood where stealing car was a, right, was a rite of passage, I had a master's degree in auto theft before I received my gun and shield. So my question was, so did you steal cars before you became a policeman? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was a good kid, but I'll, t I'll tell you a funny story. Freshman year, me and my friend would do is there's a Catholic high school in Throg's Neck called Preston High School. J-Lo went there, Jenny from the Bronx, right. who, who was not poor, by the way. And across the street from Preston High School were row houses where my friend lived. So dismissal time, I don't know, I think we got out. We got out earlier than Preston. So my friend and I, we would do is every day, we would run home. I would set up a lawn chair in front of his house. I'd stand in the middle of the street with a wiffle ball and pitch into the chair. The strike zone was the backing of the chair. And he would hit home runs over the fence into Preston High School. And we would watch the girls at dismissal time. That was, they, we were playing wiffle ball, but we wanted to see the girls coming out of Preston. So one day, dismissal time is over, and we stayed a little longer. And was, I'm pitching to him. And this Cutlass Supreme, it, it, the cars had just changed style. Like the, the cars had started getting smaller, the Buick Regals, the Cutlass. They used to be like gunships. And then I think it was 1980, the, the body style of these cars became smaller. And I'm in the middle of the street, and three guys from my high school, like, you know, they sit in my class. I mean, it wasn't, they weren't my best friends, but I knew them. They come, like, we're 14 years old. And they come driving by in this Cutlass with jersey plates, and they wave to me. And me and my buddy start laughing. We're like, there is no way, you know, like, we know they're too young to drive, and they're not from New Jersey, right? So we start laughing, and they drive away. So I'm in the street, right, and I'm pitching. About 30 seconds later, I hear police siren, right? And here comes, the, they come barreling down the block, turn the corner on two wheels. I jump on the sidewalk, and they take off, and here comes a police car looking for them, Right? So they dump the car, and they, they make their way. They kind of split up because there was only two of them, and they said to my friend, can we hide in your yard? And what's he going to tell them? No. So they hid in the yard, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we, 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 saw this, we found this car in the dump. It was already stolen, so we jumped into it, and we took it for a ride. That was brilliant. That was a bit of a rock, rock, and, roll, uh, rock and roll evening then. It, all the time. We used to go into the dump, and we would find stolen cars. All the time in the dump, sometimes running, sometimes not. I remember one time we went into the dump, there was a bunch of stolen cars, and the cops were hiding. I mean, thank God we didn't go up to them. And they were like, what are you doing? And they started questioning us, like, we just, you know, we're 14-year-old boys. We're exploring. You know what I mean? We, we didn't steal the car. Then I remember because they, they, they searched us for tools. So if one of us would have had a screwdriver or something, we were going. But, um, mm. yeah, I mean, it was around. Why was auto crime such a popular thing in New York City? Auto theft, okay, so the, re the reason auto theft in New York City back then was so high, auto theft, the, the people steal cars for a variety of reasons, okay? Auto th it starts with teenagers. Stealing a car is a rite of passage. Teenagers steal cars because they look cool, 
They can take their girlfriend to the movie. They can drive around the school at dismissal. And everybody's like, hey, wow, he's crazy. He stole a car. They're the easiest to spot because they'll hold on. And junkies, too. Junkies, they're not professional car thieves per se, but they'll steal a car to get high. They'll steal a car to commit other crimes. They're homeless. Their families had it with them, so they'll steal a car. They'll buy a couple of bags of dope. They'll go into a wooded area or a park. They'll shoot up. They'll pass out in the car. Kids and junkies, they're a pain in the ass. They steal a lot of cars, but they're the easiest to catch because... A professional car thief takes it from point A to point B. He's going to strip it or he's going to bring it to a place to be stripped and he's done. A junkie or a kid, it's their mode of transportation. So if a car gets a flat, right, you go into your trunk and you have that little balloon spare tire, that little tire looks like a donut, which is supposed to be only good for like 50 or 100 miles. They're they're not going to buy a new tire for their stolen car. They're going to slap that thing on and drive around until it blows off. They're never going to wash the car. You'll see them driving around with summonses stuffed in the window. Or if they parked illegally, someone will slap that you are illegally parked nasty sticker on the side of the window that you want to come out and kick someone's ass. The car will have damage. Or you'll see like a fucked up, beat up car. Or a new car. A brand new car with like a fucked up, bent up license plate. That You know, come on. If the car looks like this, where would the license plate like that come from? So they'll switch the plate. There's a lot of ways. To, to mask and, and and try to mask a stolen car. but And then you have the professionals. They steal cars. They're, they're the ones, you know, they take orders from body shops. They take orders from junkyards. Or they take orders from guys that are shipping cars out of the country. I mean, you know, that's their job. They wake up and morning to night, they're out there on the phone. What do you need? And I'll get it for you. Yeah, you speak um, a lot about that. Obviously, you would because your book's in ty- uh, title. Ground Theft Auto, but you speak a lot about the kind of um, procedure, if you like, about international car um, smuggling rings and the uh, different groups, different nationalities that are involved in them, which is a fascinating read. So were the Mafia involved in car crime? Oh, yeah. Um, more so in, in um, Queens and Brooklyn and the Bronx. But yeah, there were, there, were, there were some guys in the Bronx that were involved in auto theft. And for different reasons. Some guys would tag a car. So a tagging of a car is, say for argument's sake, you come to me and you say, you know what, I want a brand new, I, I want a newer BMW. And say for argument's sake, you want a 2022 BMW. And I say, I'll tell you what, give me $10,000 and I'll get you that car. But don't ask me any questions. Or you know what I'm going to do. So, I mean, I've been out of the game, so my figures might be wrong, but this is the way it works. So you give me $10,000, I go to an auction, and I buy a 2020 BMW 5 Series that was burned. Just it's, it's, it's not coming back to life. The car is just a wreck. It's just for parts. I salvage any VIN numbers I can off that car, and I have the title for that car. Then what I do is I go out and steal a 2020, 2021, 2022 Get it as close as I can the year, color, body style. Sometimes guys get greedy and they'll steal, a, they'll, buy, they'll buy a salvaged 3 Series BMW and then go out and steal an M3. It doesn't, it, it, that, those guys made it really easy for us. Like we look at the VIN number and the VIN number, that 18 character number that's in your front, that tells the car's story, what it's supposed to motor, options in the car. So that, then what I do is, I spend $3,000, I just pocketed $7,000, here's your title, here's your cargo register. There's more to it than that, but that's basically how it's done. And the mob were involved in that, more, more so capos, weren't they? They owned the yards and operated from there. Well, it didn't have to be a capo, it could be a mob associate, it could be, it could be a maid guy. I mean, there were maid guys that owned, that owned places, there were capos that owned, and then there were just associates, guys that were around them. You know, I mean, a lot of guys get involved with the mafia. They can't get made. They're half Irish or they're fully Irish or they're German. But once you're on record with a mobster, that opens up the possibilities. Now you can loan shark. Now you can put money out on the street and you're allowed to do it as well. And and then you kick that money up. Not all of it. You kick up 10% of of what you're making to, to your guy. And everyone's happy. You can also get involved. It, it enables you, once you're on record with another mobster, that means no one can claim you. No one else can mess with you or try to extort you because you're kicking up to this guy. 
So Carmine Agnello, uh, John Gotti's um, ex-son-in-law now, he was involved in this, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. his base of operations was in Queens out in Willits Point. Um, he basically ran that area. Our Queens office did a case on him. I Again, I think I told you this earlier. Like I wasn't part of that case other than the arrest team that went to get him that day. Um, he ran that area out in Queens. So if you owned a bot, it was all glass places, engine places, um, parts, everything. If if you wanted to do business there, you, you had to deal with him. I mean, there was just no way around it. So what our Queens office did was they rented out some commercial space. They set up a bogus junkyard. They registered with New York State Department of Motor Vehicles. And he came in and he started extorting them. And they started paying him. And, you know, you're not allowed to do that. It also, it also through him, they were able to go up on his phones and wiretaps of his associates. So, yeah, when that case came down, I mean, he got nine years. But, but the interesting right. thing about that was he branched out into the Bronx. He owned a place called, I think it was called um, New York Shredder. And, I mean, it was a successful, I, he could have been a millionaire just doing that legitimately because it was a scrap metal place. He had, the, the place took up like two city, a square, two city square blocks. And, you know, people brought in everything from wreck cars to washing machines to old MRI machines, anything metal. And he had this tremendous machine and it would go, the stuff would go up a conveyor belt. It would get shredded, and the machine, it was amazing to me, the machine would shred things and separate it. Like, this type of metal went here, this type of metal went there, and then there was the fluff. So if you threw a car in there, the fluff was like car seats, and then this crap that was non-metal was fascinating. I mean, this is before artificial intelligence. This is like the late 90s, early 2000s. But he could have made millions, I mean, just doing that legitimately. But It's not in his blood, is it? Apparently <laughs> not. <laughs> so what was it? What? So can you take us through the arrest? Was was he cooperative? Yeah. Arrogant? Um, what was he like? So when our Queen's office or like the Bronx office, the, you know, there's a case. Like a lot of things is on a need to know basis. So in the auto, in the auto crime division is under the umbrella of the organized crime division. So right. a lot of times with sensitive cases, because mob guys, they know people in law enforcement. You know, a lot, a lot of cops come from these neighborhoods and have relatives in the mob. And, you know, unfortunately, some of them keep their ears open and sometimes they'll talk. So cases like that with a major organized crime figure, and he was considered at the time a major organized crime figure, everything's on a need-to-know basis. So, like, in the Bronx office, we knew there was a major case going on out in Queens because whenever we would go out there, it was very hush-hush. I mean... We kind of knew who the target was. No one told us, but you kind of know. I mean, just the amount of resources. Like, we had four or five guys that were undercovers in that case, and they vanished. They weren't reporting out to Queens. No one saw them. You know, if guys ran into them, it's like, I can't really get into it. So, And then, then the guys running the case really were tight-lipped. But, and you don't ask questions. It's just one of those things. It's almost like in the mob when they say, you know, when two or three guys do a hit, and then you're not supposed to talk about it again. Because if I start asking, so if I start asking my buddy out in Queens who's working on this case, come on, you can tell me, you can tell me, you can tell me. And he tells me, right? And then they find out later there's a leak. Guess who they're going to look at? Vic was asking a lot of questions, and then I'm going to get pulled in. And then I'm going to get scrutiny, and they might be looking at my phone record. So you, you don't want to get too close to the fire until it's, it's definitely on a need-to-know basis. So the way it worked was this. You would get usually told a day or two before a case was coming down, listen, don't make any plans, no training, day after tomorrow, we're taking down a case. That's it. Don't ask any questions, that's it. So for our, that, that night, that morning, like any other morning, we would report out to the Bronx at like 4.30 in the morning, right? We had a bunch of us with all the Bronx guys, like 20 of us, would pile into three or four cars, and we would drive out to the Queens base, which, by the way, our Queens base at the time was at Creedmoor Psychiatric Facility. The NYPD's got this thing about finding commercial space in places where, when I worked in narcotics, it was in an armory where there was asbestos. You couldn't drink the water, and when you flushed the toilet, it was hot water and piss flies the size of bats would buzz your head. 
Like they, they don't. It's not like you see like in a movie where the LA cops are in suits and there's glass doors. No, we were on the third floor of a psychiatric facility, and we were like, when they left, it was like folders of, of electroshock therapy and stuff in the background. It was crazy shit. So anyway, we drive out to Queens. They got coffee and bagels. Everybody sit down. We go in a big room. It's like all right, Ferrari, O'Brien, Sergeant Morris, step up. We come up. They'll hand us three or four manila folders. Each one of us gets a folder, pull it open. There's your photo on there, your address, photo of your address, directions on how to get to your address, okay, your work address, your girlfriend's address, start here, and it would be numbered. So we know you usually, you're usually a pretty responsible guy. You go home early, you usually get, they, they've had you surveilled for months. They know you usually leave your house at 7. So now it's about 5.36 in the morning. They want they say, okay, 5.30, 6 o'clock, start getting these guys because they know the second you start knocking on doors, people are going to start calling and then people start disappearing and it takes forever to find them. They want that press conference that day. They want to be able to say they hit this place. They've got 20 people. They don't want everybody going into the wind showing up with their lawyers later because when you catch people with their pants down, sometimes you get their phone, a slip of paper. Might be You might go into their house and there's t 10 guns sitting out in the open because they don't know you're coming. You never know. So it's the element of surprise. So you start knocking on guys' doors, and you just start rounding them up. And one by one, you grab them, and usually they'll do it at NYPD precinct, or they'll rent a place. The place has no idea what's going on, and they have a processing center. There's tables set up, and you just bring that guy there. You hand him his driver's license. You search him, and you hand him over, and there's a processing team, and they're doing everything. I remember one time we did an insurance fraud case. It wasn't my case, but I was involved. Same thing. I got a folder, and it was for a woman out in Howard Beach. Husband was a mobster. And the case was it was a junkyard out in Brooklyn or Queens, and they were doing IJs or insurance jobs. So what our, one of our offices did was they set up a pole camera out front of this junkyard. Brand new cars were coming in, and they were never leaving. Now, say for argument's sake, this brand new Mercedes comes in on the first of the month. They run the plate. It's not reported stolen. They run the plate the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. The tenth of the month, the car gets reported stolen. And on the report, the woman says she had the car on the ninth. Well, that's impossible. The car went in on the first and it was dismantled. It's insurance fraud. It's a give up. I don't want, it's a lease. I got too many miles on it. The car's dinged. When I return it, I'm going to spend $3,000, right? Or... My kid threw up in the back seat, and I don't want. I burned out the engine, and I don't want it anymore. So it's a give up. You give the car. You know the guy that works in the junkyard. He's going to take it off your hands once the car's cut into pieces and the parts are in, go their separate ways. Go report it stolen. But we have, <laughs> we have video of the car going in on the first. So we knock on the door. Mobster comes downstairs, <laughs> and he's pissed. He's like in his underwear and a t-shirt. He goes, "Yeah, so got arrest warrant." He goes, "State or federal?" State. He goes, "Oh." So he wasn't as concerned, you know, because the federal sentences are a lot worse. He goes, oh, he goes, come in. So we come in, and I go, it's not for you. What do you mean it's not for me? I go, it's for your wife. He goes, my wife. I go, the car. He goes, oh. He goes, can you give me a second? I said, yeah. So he goes upstairs. I hear him and the wife, and they're, pss, 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 pss. they're whispering. She comes downstairs, and if looks could kill. Because the car was registered in her name. He made the car disappear and told her to make the report. So she's got locked up for the car. So obviously there was going to be a piece of jewelry or a trip to Vegas as a result of this. But, like, it was the funniest thing. Like, he was relieved we weren't the feds. But then once we told him it was the wife, he's like, I really wish you could lock me up instead. Because he goes, I got to live with her. I'm like, sorry. Someone was in for a bollocking when she got home then from jail. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so, so when, when Carmine Agnello got arrested, I think we went by, it was snowing that day. I remember it was snowing. We went by the house. He was already gone because it took us forever in the snow. So then we went to the shredder. He was there. We came in, and he, he was jovial. I mean, he, he you know, he, he was cool with us. I mean, you could tell he ran that operation with an iron fist. Um, you know, uh, he ordered pizza. I remember that. Like, he's like, listen, if I'm going to go to jail, can I order a pizza? And like, sure. Because there was stuff that, that – we were just there to just take him. There were other detectives there that had a search warrant for the place. It, our job 
was just to take him out of that place and bring him to the processing center. So he called his lawyer. He had a really good lawyer. The lawyer showed up. He started reading the indictment, and he looked at him. He goes, you got a problem. That His mood changed instantly. Um, and, you know, he, I think it was Sicilian. He ordered a Sicilian pie, and, you know, he, he walked out that day. I, I'm sure he made bail. And but he wound up that and the feds had a tax case on him and he wound up getting eight or nine years federally and I think state. That's really interesting. Um, I think Vicky got got he left him as well while he was in prison. Maybe it was on that case or another one. I don't know. I, I believe so. I think that had something to do with it. So before we go on to one of my favorite subjects, actually, in your book, Fireworks, let's ask, <laughs> let me ask one more question about car, fire, car, uh, car theft. So what is the difference bet- between um, the car criminal world now, let's say the um, security in cars, uh, for when you first started to when you left? Was it as prominent car crime or it, 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 the technology kind of helped? Car- yeah, so we went from 150,000 stolen cars a year. I mean, the number it was ridiculously low when I retired. They were still stealing cars, but it was no win. It was more difficult because uh, crime was down. We had better technology. The computers were faster in the cars. They had started just as I was retiring with plate readers. So you just drive around, and there's two cameras mounted on either side of your car, and it's just taking photographs of, of license plates as you're driving it and running the plate for you as opposed to you driving and me banging out plate after plate after plate. Um, nowadays, now they made, you got to remember auto, it wasn't, it wasn't in the auto manufacturer's best interest to make the cars difficult to steal. You get a car, your car gets stolen. The insurance company cuts you a check and you go buy a new car. Right. So they really weren't interested in fortifying the steering columns back then. Now, nowadays everything is with the key fobs, right? The, I could steal a car and I had to steal a couple of cars with search warrants in the NYPD, and I know how to steal cars because being around them and learning everything about it, but, like, nowadays it would be very difficult for me to, the old cars I could steal, but, like, the new ones, anything with the technology, no, it, it's definitely more difficult, but, and that's why you saw an increase in carjacking because a lot of these thieves aren't sophisticated, but they want the car, especially the younger guys, you know, they'll think nothing of waving a gun in someone's face and pulling them out the window. Well, of course. And the mafia used to use uh, cars, uh, stolen cars, as getaway cars, didn't they? And robbery cars and things like that back in the day. Yeah, for hits, to, to do a murder, um, or to do, you know, other crimes. Sure, I mean, sometimes they, not always, I mean, sometimes they'll just, they'll, they'll throw a stolen plate on there. And a lot of the mob guys own these dealerships and secondhand car dealerships. So when you own a secondhand car dealership, you can get transporter license plates. So say you and I open up a, a secondhand car dealership. That enables us, we got to pay for it, we can get 5, 10, I don't know what the number is, but we can get metal license plates that says New York Transporter on it with a number. So what the mob guys would do is they'd get their 10 plates, and then over time they would report three or four of them stolen and keep them. And then right. when someone wanted to do a hit, they'd give out the plate. And then, you know, there was a homicide, but the plate was reported stolen. Right. We knew what they would do, and it just made it more difficult. Yeah, of course. So fireworks. I had no idea <laughs> that no idea that the mob had a monopoly on illegal fireworks in, in, in New York City. Could you, could you explain that, please? Yeah. So fireworks in New York City when I was a kid, it was a big deal. I mean, every, it was around, I mean... From June until August, I mean, my neighborhood smelled like gunpowder. It was like living in Beirut. And there was a family that lived across the street from me, and their name ended in a vowel, but they weren't in the mafia. And every year they would put on, like, this tiny block, like a Gucci. They'd spent a couple of thousand dollars in the 70s. And, like, the following day, my whole, neighbor, my whole street was paper. So my brother and I, like, five, ten years old, my parents are at work, being watched by my grandparents. So my brother and I, we grab garbage cans and pick up all the duds from the night before. We put them in a garbage can and we put them in the backyard. My grandparents are in their 80s, right? Then this is, this is how times have changed. I'm like 10 years old. I walk to the gas station with a milk container 
and I get 50 cents worth of gasoline. Like, the guy at the gas station didn't say, why does a 10-year-old putting 50 cents worth of gasoline in a gallon milk container? Go back to my yard, pour the gasoline in, in the garbage can filled with duds, light the match, and I'll never forget, it was like a blanket, a warm blanket. It just knocked me on the floor. It was like backdraft, like singed my hair and what little eyebrows I had. And the garbage can is just going up, and every couple of minutes it would burp and shoot out a thing of burnt ambers. My grandfather comes running out. He gets the hose. He puts it out. They give me a kick in the ass. They send me into the house, right? My father comes home that night. My grandfather thought he was like Harvey Keitel in Pulp Fiction. He tried to clean it up, but he's 80 years old, right? So there's burnt paper all around the backyard, and it looks like a UFO burnt a fucking crop circle in the center of our yard. So my father's like, all right, what happened? So, you know, I got the speech. I don't want you around fireworks, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, tell a 14, a 10-year-old kid not to be around fireworks. So in my neighborhood, you could buy fire. There was certain connections in my neighborhood. It was all controlled by the mob, as I found out later. One of our connections was there was a mailman. And every day, <laughs> we would wait at this guy's house. And he lived on Tremont Avenue, which is the main drag. It's not like he was, like, down a side street. Every day after school, or it was the summer, you'd have like 10, 15 boys, like crows, sitting on his fence just waiting for this guy. He'd pull up in this shitbag of car in his mailman uniform with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. He'd go, all right, wait up, wait up. I want this, I want bottle rockets, I want that. Yeah, all right. He'd go in the house. He'd open the garage, tiny garage. He'd, cigarette still hanging out of his mouth now with a beer. All right, what do you want? Like, the older kids would push their way in. I want a gross of this. I want cherry bombs. I want sparklers. Sparklers. Get the fuck out of here, right? We want, like, the heavy-duty shit, the M80s, the blockbusters. And boys will leave it on their bicycles, like, with bags of this crap. Like, they can blow their hands off. So I joined the NYPD, and now Rudy Giuliani is mayor. And Rudy, being a former federal prosecutor, knows the mafia makes millions of dollars every year off of illegal fireworks. So what they started doing was cracking down on it. And the fireworks come from down south, and they would, they would try to intercept the tractor trailers through wiretaps. Fireworks, Vice used to hit the mob guys around the, around the 4th of July, but then the whole department piled on. And, and basically, you didn't hear, it went from New York being Beirut to you didn't hear like a pop gun fart. You know, it just, it, it just we just eradicated fireworks. I'm sure it's back to normal, though. I love the story that you tell of um, we down Mulberry Street, I think. Or, oh yeah, and, uh, I know you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and, and you, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's three hundred pound. Yeah. yeah, down a little Italy. Like we lodged a prisoner. I was in narcotics. We lodged a prisoner. It was a couple of weeks before the fourth. So I was a three hundred pound Italian guy with a garbage bag, like a thirty gallon garbage bag with fireworks hanging out of it. Blockbusters, cherry bomb. I mean, just standing on the corner screaming. <laughs> Did you did you read the story and, about and you, what they, they used to send us out of state? Yes. So what the story, NYPD yeah. did was so in Pennsylvania, Delaware, and maybe <laughs> Connecticut, but I know Pennsylvania and Delaware fireworks are legal for for uh, for for uh, chasing birds. Like there's like a loophole where fireworks are like if you have birds, you're allowed to shoot rockets. It's all bullshit. But anyway, it's legal in certain states. So what the NYPD would do is. On overtime, they'd send detectives to these firework emporiums out of state. And we would sit on the firework emporiums, right, in Pennsylvania. And we would look for cars that would come in with New York license plates. So we weren't looking to lock up a guy with his kid getting a bag of sparklers or, or, or firecrackers. We wanted guys showing up with trucks and SUVs. So we'd sit in the park. <laughs> so there, this one particular time across the street from this fireworks emporium in Pennsylvania, there's a motel. So my partner and I are sitting in the motel. We're drinking coffee and got binoculars and running plates. And the firework guy knows what we're doing. So he comes into the park line. He goes, I want you out of here. I know you're NYPD. I says, do you own the motel? Well, I know the owner. I says, if the motel owner tells us to leave, we'll leave, right? So he gets on the phone. He's trying to get the motel owner, right? And he's yelling and screaming, trying to get this guy on the phone. With that, these two weightlifting guys pull up, they open up a van, and they took the seats out. It was like a minivan. And basically, they get like a pallet or two of fireworks. They're just packing this thing in. 
and we run the plate, it comes back to Long Island. So although Long Island's not New York City, there's no way of them getting to Long Island without passing through New York City. So we got him. So as we're running the plate, just as they're about to pull off, the guy goes, I got him on the phone. Get out. And he throws the phone in my face. I'm like, I don't fuck out of here. I threw the phone back out the window. I hit the guy in the chest with his phone, and it bounced in a puddle, and we took off. So we follow these two husky guys, and we follow them. They go over the George Washington Bridge. We follow them for about an hour, hour and a half. As soon as they got over by Yankee Stadium, we pulled them over. And it was a nice haul. I mean, we got went out a ton of fireworks. Another one of your brilliant quotes on, in the book is um, the Mulberry Street again. Wise guys littered the block, shaking hands and kissing cheeks like Disney characters greeting small children at the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> and well, they all, as soon as they bump into each other, oh, you know, and it's, it's a kiss on each cheek and a shake of the hand and a pat in the back. Yeah, that's kind of what it reminded me of, of, of cast members at a Disney. Yeah, brilliant. You man- we mentioned him a few times, uh, Rudy Giuliani. So how did... Was Rudy Giuliani um, positive for you, do you think, for the, for the city and for the cops? Oh, yeah. Rudy, Rudy, there's two schools of thought with NYPD cops on, on Rudy. Like, people like my brother can't stand him. I really like the guy. So Rudy was a former federal prosecutor. He was a U.S. attorney for the Southern District. Rudy used the RICO law laws to break the iron grip that the five families of the mafia had on New York City. You got to remember the mafia controlled construction, materials, everything. And, you know, people that were cooperated were you the baseball batter to kill. What Rudy did was he used those, those RICO laws and had some very high profile cases, the commission case, the windows case, the pizza connection case, decimated the mob. I mean, literally, like, just took out the top tier leadership of the mafia and really gutted it. Once he got out, once he got out of um, out of the U.S. Attorney's office, he decided he was going to run for the city of New York. So the first thing he did was he went to the NYPD Police Union and he says, "You know, I want you guys to endorse me." And they said, "Well, we haven't had a contract in years." He goes, "Don't worry, I'm going to take care of you guys." He said, "All right." So a lot of guys, cops, volunteered their time to drive Rudy around, show up at you know events with him, be, be his bodyguards and protection. Once Rudy got in. He saw that New York City was basically broke. And he said, I can't give you guys the contract you want. So guys like my brother got pissed off at him and they hated him. But the thing with Rudy was he backed the cops. Unlike the previous two administrations, Koch and Dinkins, well, really Dinkins, who never backed the cops, Rudy backed the cops. He got us a really great police commissioner, Bill Bratton. And if you were willing to make arrests, you got paid overtime. So somebody like myself, I liked him. I like making arrests. I like that I could work without having to look over my shoulder. So for me, Rudy was great. Guys like my brother, my brother was an inside guy. My brother never, my brother made like eight arrests his whole career. So my brother hates Rudy. You can't even bring up his name. My brother will have an aneurysm. So Rudy was really good for New York City. And then what happens is 9-11 comes around. And once 9-11 came around, I mean, Rudy stepped up. I mean, Rudy really, New York needed Rudy, and Rudy, Rudy, you know, answered the bell. How did Giuliani clean up the streets of New York, would you say? Well, first and foremost, he backed the cops. He wanted them to make arrests. So when I first got hired by the NYPD, they didn't want patrol cops making quality of life crime. So in my day early on, if you came into the station house and you grabbed a guy with a bag full of crack, say there was a crack line of 30 guys waiting waiting to get hit up on a crack line, and you grabbed the guy with the bag with the crack, they'd get pissed off at you. You'd come into the station house. They did not want street cops making street-level drug arrests. What, what are you doing? Don't get involved with narcotics. Same as if you – um you, you uh, recovered a stolen car in the street and you had it towed. Like, what are you doing this for? You, you know, I'm, we're holding 30 calls and you get involved in this. Giuliani administration realized it's the little things. It's like putting pennies in a jar. The, the more people you arrest, sometimes a lot of these criminals don't carry ID. In the old days, instead of looking the other way, when a guy was stripping a car, we would grab the guy. He doesn't have ID. We'd put him through the system. And guess what? These people that you're grabbing for minor crimes are wanted for bigger crimes, or they're not committing crimes anymore. So it was the quality of life issues that Giuliani took the handcuffs off the police and told us, just make arrests, lawful arrests. And they didn't care how big or too small. 
and New York City got cleaned up. You call Rudy Giuliani in relation to the mob uh, a street sweeper. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, because like I said earlier about all those federal cases he did with them, he understood the mob thoroughly and he knew the choke point. He knew he knew that if he could cut off their finances, it, it, a lot of them would just would, would have to get into something else to, just, to disrupt them. So like I said, the fireworks, sports betting, he just went after the choke point as far as cutting off their resources to money. And you got to remember, as a former federal prosecutor, he knew them backward and forward. John Gotti really got under his skin, didn't he, in, in more ways than one. But the fireworks was a, was a good example. You, you mentioned <laughs> it in your book. Could you just give a description of what what why he wound uh, Rudy Giuliani up? Well, well, yeah, because Gotti was Gotti. People forget Gotti had two or three trials that he beat, and the reason he beat the trials is because he had Sammy the Bull Gravano fix the jury for him. So what they did was they were able to infiltrate the jury pool, and for you know. Thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. They were able to buy one or two jurors off on a couple of these juries, so he was found not guilty. And after one of the acquittals, which they knew something wasn't right, Gotti goes back to his base of operations out in Queens, the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, and they throw on a fireworks display, like this Gucci fireworks display. So the cops showed up. And they started arresting Gotti's guys, but they had so many fireworks that Gotti's guys went to the rooftops of buildings and they were still doing it. And Rudy said, all right, you want to play that game? And that's where that really got under his skin to the point where he really targeted the fireworks. Because there's video footage of that, isn't there? Of yeah. When um, Gotti, Gotti uh, beats trial and Gravano's with him. And then they're both looking up at like yeah. all these like fireworks going off left, right. And yeah, center. it's like they're in front of the Magic Kingdom waiting, <laughs> wait, waiting for the fireworks to go off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You mentioned that you think the mafia underestimated Giuliani. Why, why do you think that? Um, I, I think at first they thought he was a pain in the ass. You know, he was just trying to grab headlines. I think I am. Um, I, I don't think they took him seriously. I don't I, I don't think that they really understood the RICO laws. I, I think um, their attorneys, once they were in the soup, explained to him to them how much trouble they were in. And they did. They underestimated Rudy with his own peril. Another topic I find fascinating is um, dirty cops, bent cops in New York's had. I remember listening to it over here it being on the news here. The, the reputation of the cops in the um, 80s and 90s in in New York was was terrible when it came to corruption. I've identified, and I'm sure you know more, but several sort of high profile cases. The Dirty Thirty. Did you know anything about that? Were you involved in any <laughs> of that? Obviously, not as corruption, but you know. Did yeah, you know no. So the Dirty Thirty, Thirty Thirtieth Precinct is in um, the Washington Heights section of Manhattan. There's a lot of drugs. I mean, I'm talking the, the precinct is a washing drugs and I'm talking wholesale drugs like kilos. So there's a lot of money in those neighborhoods. The, the drug trade fuels those neighborhoods. So you go into that neighborhood of Jackson Heights, Queens. What are you going to say? Tons of restaurants, tons of clothing stores. I mean, as mo too many. And then back then before cell phones, telecommunicado places where you can call Columbia for like 75 cents a minute. All these places were, were money laundering operations for the drug cartels. Drugs comes back in the day. Now, things have changed, obviously, with the Mexican cartels. But back then, drugs came into New York City. The Colombians brought it in to Jackson Heights, Queens. And then the Dominicans from Washington Heights would buy it off of them. The drugs would go to the Heights and the Dominicans then would sell to everybody. And I was in the narcotics division at the time and I was assigned to Washington Heights. And I'll never forget. A guy that I worked with was dating a neighborhood girl, and he said, we were in the 301 time, and he said, you know, he says, there's something going on in this precinct. And I go, well, what do you mean? He goes, goes my, this girl he's dating, her brother's a dirtbag, he's a street kid. He goes, but he said that the cops are going around ripping off the drug dealers. And I said, do you believe that? He goes, I don't know. He goes, I, he goes, I don't trust this kid as far as I could throw him. I stay away from him. He says, but that's what he told me. So... You know, that kind of sticks in your head. So one time we did a, a buy and bust operation where buy and bust operation works like this. One day I come into work and the sergeant says, John, Rob, you guys are getting on. That means you and I are going to take the arrest for the day. So the sergeant's going to hand us a hundred dollar bill. 
You and I are going to run to a deli. We're going to break that de- the $100 bill into denominations, into singles, fives, tens, twenties, et cetera. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take all the denominations, that money, and we're going to photocopy it. The reason we're photocopying the serial numbers on the money is that's pre-recorded buy money. So this way, when we lock up a guy after a buy, if he's got pre-recorded buy money on him, that strengthens the case. It's just not the undercover's word that, hey, I walked up to this guy and, and he sold me 20 vials of crack. Then you, right. what you do is you give the money out to the undercovers, right? There's two, three or four undercovers. So you and I are going to ride in a car with the sergeant, right? A couple of our friends are going to be in other police cars, uh, unmarked cars. And then the undercovers are going to be in another car. So the, a buy and bust operation, you're using like five or six cars, right? And the undercovers are going to have what's called a TAC plan. A TAC plan is going to be a bunch of sets. We call like a corner that's selling drugs like a movie set. Each set sells different things. One set might sell Blue Thunder heroin. Another set might sell Red Top Crack. Drug dealers, it's like a franchise, right? They want to be known for their product. So you don't want to send your undercover to a heroin spot looking for crack because he might get hit with a baseball bat. So you, you want to have as much intel as you can. So what happens is the undercover gets out. He goes up to the corner. Another undercover is going to follow him from a safe distance. That's called a ghost. A ghost is going to sit back and watch what happens to the money, make sure the undercover gets off the set. No one tries to rob him. Sometimes the the drug dealer, after he makes the sale, will go into a building. So the ghost's job to keep eyes on the guy after the sale. Once the undercover buys the drugs, gets safely back to the car or a safe distance away, he's going to get on the radio, which goes back to the car with the, with the two guys that are getting on and the sergeant. He's going to say positive buy. Two male Hispanics, green shirt, red shirt. The money is in a brown paper bag. The drugs are under a license plate. So I'm just going to say, move in. And we pull up. And back then during the crack wars of the, of the 90s, it was like the rodeo. We'd pull up to like a corner like 110 and Lex. You'd have 100 people in the drug trade on four corners, right? You'd have hand-to-hands, the guys that are the dealers. You'd have managers. You'd have lookouts. You might have on a busy corner where they're making, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a day enforcers. Guy with a gun to make sure the spot don't get ripped off. Once you pull in, it's like the rodeo. Fucking people throwing shit in the air. Like I'm looking for a guy with a red shirt and a guy with a green shirt. Just drop ten decks of heroin. Like, fucking grab him, right? So it, it's like you're just gra- grabbing people, rounding people up. Once you get cuffs on them and you search them, you call for the P van. A P van is an unmarked van, like a panel truck. It's gonna pull up. You throw them in the back of the van, you go to the next set, and you keep going to sets until you load that van up with drug dealers, and then you go to a precinct (laughs) to process the arrest. So one day we did a buy and bust operation. Inside the car with the sergeant and the two guys getting on, you have, it looked like the technology has definitely changed. This is the 90s, but it looked like a James Bond thing, like, like a James Bond villain would carry. It was a silver briefcase that would open up, and it was a listening device. It's called the Kell receiver, and the Kell receiver listens to the undercovers wearing a wire. It's called a Kel. So we could hear everything that's going on in the street. So one day after a buy and bust operation, we decided to stop by the 3-0 precinct to use the bathroom. So we pull up to the 3-0 precinct and we hear the Kel is still on and we hear chatter. So my sergeant gets on the radio and tells the undercover, he goes, turn off your Kel, we can still hear you. He goes, I'm out of range. He goes, I'm back at our office. He goes, I, my, my Kel, I already turned it in. So like, who are we listening to? And so we're listening to the Kel. It's coming from the locker room. Someone's wearing a wire and we're picking it up in our, in, 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 in the narcotics van. So like, holy shit, someone's wearing a wire in, in, in the precinct. So we're like, let's get the fuck out of here. Like we, we didn't want to get involved. So we knew there was an IEB operation going on and we left. About a month or so after that, we did buy and bust, not in the three O, but the precinct next door. I think it was the three. It used to be the, th- it used to be the three four. Now it's the three three. But we did we did buy and bust in a neighboring precinct, very close to the border of the three O. So I had the P van. So after we processed the prisoners, I dropped the prisoners off at this at, at at a precinct for lodging. My partner and I are leaving. We get something to eat. We're gonna go back to our office, and I noticed a pair of sunglasses in the van. The quickest way to get in trouble in the NYPD is property, where someone says, I had a set of sunglasses, I had this, they threw it out. You don't want to go to internal affairs on nonsense. So I said, I don't fucking believe this. I found a pair of sunglasses. So my partner goes, throw it out. I go, it's not worth it. I says, let me go back. It was, where did we lodge the prisoners? We lodged the prisoners in the 2-5. I said, let's go to the 2-5. 
I'll, let me give the sunglasses back. I'll yell into the cells. Who lost a pair of sunglasses? Someone will answer up and we'll be fine. He goes, all right. So now this is like a half hour, 45 minutes have passed since we dropped off the prison. We go to the two five. And when you step into an NYPD precinct, everybody turns around. It's the, it's the, it's, it's, it's the wildest thing, but it, there could be a million things going on in a precinct, prisoners screaming. Cops are so observant. The second a stranger walks in, you get the look. And if a guy knows you or sees you and you got your shield around your neck and the way you're dressed, they can figure out if you're friendly or you're not friendly. We walked into that and I had just been in there a half hour before I walk in and everybody's like this. So I know something's off. And the desk officer goes, come here. So he goes, what, what do you want? I just dropped off prisons. He knows I, you know, I'm from narcotics. He goes, what do you want? I says, I got a guy's sunglasses. He goes, give me the sunglasses. So I handed it to the desk officer, which was unusual. And he goes, just get out of here. And I said, why? He goes, because internal affairs just showed up and they pulled all the prisoners you guys just dropped off and they're interviewing them one by one. So he said, and, and so we realized that what, narcot what internal affairs was doing was after we locked up drug dealers, they were debriefing them to find out what was going on in the 3-0. So between that Kel going off and that, we knew something big was going on. So when that story broke, I knew one of the guys in there, not well, but I knew one of the guys there because in the precinct, years before that, in the precinct I worked in, one of my friends went through the police academy with this guy. I'm not going to say his name, but he was crazy. And the stories he was telling us, like, I remember him telling us one time, his car, he got into a car accident. And he was using a stolen car that was vouched as evidence to go back and forth to work. Like, who does that? Like, wh why would you do something like that? You know, so he was actually one of the guys that, that, that went down. But I didn't know anybody well, but, but I had met one of two of them a couple of times. And I was shocked because when I first got hired, you had Michael Dowd in the 7-5 precinct happened a couple of years before that or right around that time and just before i got hired the 7-7 precinct out in brooklyn went bad so i was always shocked when when i like you always hear one or two guys doing something crazy and they get caught but when it's systematic where there's more than two people doing it like that precinct there was like five or ten people ripping off drug dealers and getting involved in all sorts of crazy shit you chase drug dealers and, and they, like, say, locked a load of heroin. Do you ignore the heroin and go straight for the drug dealers? Or do you pick, you know, is it, what's more important to you? Well, it, if, you, if, if it's me and you are in a radio car and we bail and we're chasing a guy, one guy, one cop's going to pick up the drugs. The other one's going to keep chasing the guy. If you're on foot early on in my NYPD career, you need the evidence to make the case stick. So you're going to stop for the drugs first and then go after the guy. Although my first gun arrest, although that's not true because my first gun arrest as a rookie cop in the South Bronx precinct, I was working with this loudmouth that was bossing me around the whole night. He had like six months more than me, but he was treating me like he was a 30 year veteran and driving down the street. It was the winter time. So it's starting to get dark early. It's probably about four o'clock. It's like twilight. And I see a bunch of teenagers on a corner. I go, stop, stop. What are they doing? So he stops the car. And I got out on the passenger side. When I got out, I felt like Moses. Because all these kids parted. And there's a kid standing there with a gun in his hand. And he looks at me. I look at him. His eyes got like saucers. And he goes. Puts the gun in his pocket. And I'm chasing him. My partner gets on the radio. He doesn't know what I saw. He just sees me take off after a kid. Kid goes down by the uh, Franklin Avenue men's shelter. And I see him throw the gun under a car, but no one's on the street. Like we, there's a, there's a the running joke in New York city. Like a gun doesn't bounce on the street twice. Cause it's like a fumble. The second that some, that gun hits the ground, someone's going to pick it up, but there was no one on that street. I saw him throw it under a car and I, you know, I was young and in shape. I caught him, held him against the car, threw a set of cuffs on him. My partner came around the block. I said, hold him. And he goes, well, what did you see? What'd you see? I go, he tossed the gun and he held him. I went, you know, half a block up. Went underneath the car and I recovered. I think it was a 32. I mean, so yeah, that, that particular time I went after the kid because, you know, it just depends. As well as obviously if it's outside of school, then it's, when it's kicking out time, it's a different kettle of fish than when no one else is uh, around. I think, well, that's it? true too. If there was a lot of people around, you're probably right. I probably would have went for the gun first and lost him.
I you talk, you, you mentioned Mike Mike Dowd. I, I call him the YouTube cop because he's had loads <laughs> of interviews now and this, that, and the other. What did you know about him? Did you ever meet these guys? Like what? No, I mean, he was Nannery Brooklyn. was the thing. Oh, Nannery, yeah. Nannery I saw around. Nannery worked in the 4-4. Um, he was a cop in the 4-4 and a very active one. Nan- Nannery, I mean, I remember him a little bit early on in my career because a friend of mine worked in the 4-4 and spoke highly of him. I, he went bad, I think, when he became a sergeant. Um, saw him around, didn't know him. You know what I mean? Doubt I never saw or met before in my life. The NY- New York City is so big. And there's 40,000 NYPD cops. So Dowd worked out in Brooklyn. So I, I never saw Dowd. Really? So the what do you think of these people? Like, because I can imagine, like, you as a policeman, would, would, they would be, like, almost the lowest of the low to you, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to remember, you from the time you get hired, they tell you you're going to get fired. It, they, it starts like uh, the NYPD definitely does its due diligence warning you up front that they will fire you. You will go to jail. There's countless seminars. They bring in ex cops to talk about doing jail time. They show you videos. They bring in for, they bring in prosecutors who are tasked with um, prosecuting police corruption. I mean, it, it's not like, you know. I didn't know or no, they internal affairs speaks to you. They do integrity tests. I remember as a cop, I'm working in a precinct and um, I'm driving the sergeant. We're sitting over by a park and these two women, homeless women come up with a shopping cart. And the woman says, I found a shotgun. I said, what? So we jump out of the car. She goes, yeah, I was in the park. I found a shotgun. What should I do with this? She had a blanket over it. I lift the blanket. There's a shotgun, right? So we're taking down their information and I'm looking at them and her shoes weren't right. And having worked in narcotics, it's an old trick people will do to make themselves look dirty. They'll take carbon paper and rub it on themselves. And I was like, that's not dirt. And those shoes, she looked homeless until I looked at the shoes and I said, you guys work internal affairs. What? I said, you heard me. I said, you guys work. I said, tell you what I said, I'm going to vouch for this shotgun. I said, tell your Lieutenant. I says, give me about an hour. I'll have all the paperwork done. They can come pick the shotgun up at the precinct. And they just gave me the dirtiest look. Hour later or two hours later, a lieutenant from internal affairs came and <laughs> took the shotgun. So they're constantly doing integrity tests, things like that, you know, calling you to locations where there's drugs to see if you'll voucher it. So it's not like, you know, they warn you, they test you. So for someone like Dowd and those guys, yeah, you look at them as the lowest low because, and the NYPD doesn't come in. So you got a corrupt cop or two cops. The NYPD doesn't come in with a scalpel and take it out. They come in with a hand grenade. They'll transfer like half the precinct. So you guys get their, their lives uprooted because these two assholes or three assholes or whatever is doing something ridiculous. Yeah. The mafia cops. Uh, Stephen Caracapra and Louis Eppolito. Eppolito, yeah. Because one of them was uh, Brooklyn, wasn't he? They are both from Brooklyn. Both of them. Eppolito came from a mob family. And Caracapa, from what I read about him, was a bad kid. He had gotten arrested for burglary, but he got hired because... You had a lot of during Vietnam, there was like there was a shortage of, you know, people that wanted the job or could take the job. So he kind of got in under there. And somehow that's the thing, like when you get too it's usually most of the time bad cops are lone wolves. But every now and then you get guys and I always say it, they've got a high IQ. They take the job. Cops go bad for one or two reasons. One, they get in over they get disillusioned with the job. They get passed over for something. They're, they're, they're so their life, the personal life is in the toilet. They need money. They're going through a divorce and they cross that line. I don't agree with it, but that's what happened. Then you get like Caracapa, Eppolito, Dowd. Those guys, they have, a, say what you want about them, but they have high IQs and they're able to read people and they're able to find, either convince someone that's weak or find someone of, of like-minded, you know, and what they do is they th- then they start plotting and waiting for the right opportunity to do these things. And Caracapa and Epolito, I mean, they were working for a, 
for uh, the, the head of the Lucchese crime family, Gas Pipe Casso. I mean, they kidnapped a guy and brought him to Gas Pipe to torture. They killed Frankie Lino, uh, one of the Lino, Eddie Lino. Uh, uh, they did a hit. I mean, and there's probably more that we're never going to know about. Yeah, and they were active for like 20 years, weren't they? Well, Around I don't think that they were that bad for 20 years, but I think later in their careers, yeah, when, when they started working together, and then I think they split them up, which made them more dangerous because they had access to different things. They were probably like probably five or six years. And I remember when Castle flipped, I was in the narcotics division, and he was talking about these cops, and we didn't believe it. We said there is absolutely no way there's two cops riding around doing hits, and it was it was all true. Really? Did you know these guys? No, Before they were Brooklyn. They, they were Brooklyn. Is, and the, and I, I was a rookie. When they were doing this stuff, I was a peon. I was a rookie cop. I wouldn't oh. have had access. I was a precinct cop. Uh, like so they went on, 50, no, 50 yeah, miles away. Right, okay. Because they went on, on telly, didn't they, saying, talk, like on a talk show, if I remember rightly, talking about, oh, that, you know, about how they didn't like dirty cops and they'd never do things like that. <laughs> no, no, no. What they're they undoing were. was, Eppolito wrote a book called Mob Cop. And it was like a good cop who came from a mob family. And it had his picture on the front and his picture on the back. And Caracapa was like, are you out of your mind? We just retired. They had moved out of state. And Eppolito got a bit part in Goodfellas. He got a bit part in Casino. So his face was out there. And then when he wrote that book, Caracapa was beside himself. He goes, we have to lay low. And then he went on Sally, Jesse, Raphael, or one of these daytime talk shows. And the kid that he kidnapped was a kid by the name of Jimmy Heidel. Or Stephen Heidel. There were two of them. Two brothers. But I think it was Stephen Heidel. They were looking for him for gas pipe because the he the Heidel kid tried to kill Casso. So they found out through you know their NYPD sources that this kid Heidel was involved in the attempted murder. And Gas Pipe put a bounty on this kid's head. So they were driving around the neighborhood in their spare time with what would look like a police car dressed as cops, pretending like they were detectives on duty looking for this kid. And they couldn't find him. So first they stopped his brother who looked just like him. And they confronted him. And he goes, no, 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 you're looking for my brother. So that the brother saw them. Then they went to the house and talked to the mother. So... You know, the mother and brother remember that there were these cops looking for their kid before he vanished. Now this cop turns up on TV and the mother recognizes him from the interview. The mother goes out to Barnes and Noble or wherever and buys the book and goes, that's the guy. And then she goes to the precinct or the Brooklyn DA's office. And that's Tommy Dades. This is a really good detective. You should get him on your show. He's got a lot of good stories. He was actually the one that broke that case. Really? So if, if if these guys didn't, or one of them, didn't like write a book or get out there so much, they could have kind of sailed off on into the sunset and no one would have been any of the wiser. No, because Casso, Casso ratted them out instantly. Casso, you know, Casso, Casso, he's an interesting character because he killed everybody that was close to him and he kept records on everybody in case he had a flip. So Casso would have given them up. But I think... What really started the ball rolling was the mother and the brother. You know what I mean? I, I, I think there would have been suspicion on them. Maybe they could have made that case, but they made it a lot easier. Right. By writing that book, Eppolito did, by writing that book and then going on a book tour and then showing up in Martin Scorsese movies. I mean, come on. Silly, isn't it? So you, why did you leave the police in New York? Because you, you, for a short time, you went to Florida, didn't you? And you were policing down there. Yeah. 20 years was enough. I really enjoyed 99% of my time with the New York City Police Department, but the job was changing. I had been in my office 10 years. All my friends had either retired or moved on to different positions, got promoted or left. And I was the old guy in the office at 41 years old. You know, now this guy's coming up 25, 30 years old. My sergeant was in his 30s. He had different ideas of doing things. And I saw everybody in any form of job 
no matter how valuable they are, eventually you're going to lose your usefulness. You're going to be that guy. And in my book, my lieutenant stayed entirely too long and, and you know, became a laughing stock, but sadly. So I, I didn't want to be that. And I said, you know, maybe it, times were changing. People were changing. It, it's time to do something else. I, I want to see what I can do with the next chapter of my life. And I had no intentions of writing these books or starting a podcast. That came years after. So I retired. I moved down to Florida. I got bored. And I became a cop again for a small police department down here in Florida. Great little department, but I had changed. So here I am in my early 40s. And I'm not start. I went from working in America's largest police department to being a detective to being on the road again. And now I'm dealing with drunk drivers, domestic violence, and a patrol cop is a young man's game. It really is. And it had passed me. So, I mean, after six months of that, I says, what am I doing? Driving around midnights, drinking four cups of coffee to stay awake. You know, I'm not a kid anymore. You know, I could really get, and I don't, you know, Florida is a lot different than New York. You could blindfold me and throw me out of a car in the Bronx and I'll find my way. Even in Brooklyn or Queens that I didn't know as well, I can get my way back to the Bronx. In Florida, I mean, it, you know, swamp land and shit. I'm like, you know what? It's just time. You know, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I, may, I met some friends. I made some connections. I learned how law enforcement works here in Florida, but it was time just to wrap it up. So how was organized crime different in Florida to New York, if indeed it was? I didn't see it. I, I see wasn't it I wasn't there long enough. Do I think that? Yeah, I mean, Florida is considered an open territory for the mob. Are there guys down here under the protection of the other families doing sports betting? And yeah, but it's not like New York where you can't do this here. Or you can't do this there. I'm sure there are people involved in probably South Florida more than North Florida. But um, and not to the, I didn't see it. So of all your years, how long were you in force? NYPD 20 and then down here in Florida, like six or eight months. 20, so over 20 years. What was your like scariest? Or I'm sure, I'm sure you had several, but what was the one that jumps out at you? What was your kind of scariest moment being a cop? I've had I, I've had a couple of times where I almost lost my life. Um, scariest, it was a Saturday or Sunday morning, probably about nine, ten o'clock in the morning. My partner and I saw this pathfinder go by. I forget what it, you know, tail light or went through a red light, whatever. We pull over this car. There's a guy in the car. You can tell he's been out the night before. He smells like cologne. He's in silk shirt, clubbing, all coked up, going a million miles an hour. And I said, you know what? Why don't you step out of the car? Let me just show you. You got a taillight. And you'll be on your way. And I noticed he kept messing with his waist. So I kind of gave my partner a look. So my partner started coming around the car. When he got out of the car, he went for his waist again. And I shoved my He had like a trench coat. And he was trying to like put the tie over it, you know. And I stuck my hand in there and I felt the gun. And I grabbed the gun. I looked at him. He looked at me. And then he grabbed my hands. So now the two of us are banging off the car. My partner comes running around. I go, shoot him. And he goes, what? I go, shoot him. <laughs> gun, gun, gun. And to my partner's credit, he just cracked the guy. And the guy just kind of went limp and the gun popped out in my hand and locked him up for a gun, got out on bail. And while we were waiting to go to trial, he got locked up for a home invasion and got 18 years. But th there's been a couple of times like that when you're wrestling with a guy with a gun or a guy grabs your gun. And I can't, it's the craziest thing because, you know, we're all afraid of getting hurt. You get into a fight, you're like, I don't want to get punched in the face. I don't want to lose my teeth. Like your mind is going, it's like almost getting into an accident. The adrenaline kicks in and now you can think subsonic. And the one thing that always came to me in those situations is I can't lose this fight. If I lose this fight, I'm going to die. I can't lose. I I, I, ha I don't give a shit if I get a hernia, I lose teeth. If this person gets the upper hand, it's over for me. So that was one of those times, you know, where just like time and space, just, you know, I'm screaming at my pawn to shoot him. <laughs> you know, and he's like, what? I could just shoot him. And he's like, are you sure? 
Later on, we had a laugh about it. I go, am I sure? You know, great guy, by the way. So would you have, you guys get, like here in, in, in the UK, it's a big thing if um oh, yeah. kills and like, would, would you have got in trouble for that? No, you your guy? but we would have been dragged through the mud. So this is the way people, all right, there's, there's a misconception that I can speak for the NYPD, how they handle a police-related shooting. That, you know, me and you go and kill a guy and then we're sitting having coffee and we're having a laugh about it and let's go grab a beer. That's not the way it works. So let me give you a best case scenario shooting. You and I are working together. We're patrol cops. We're doing an eight to four, which means we come in seven o'clock in the morning. Eight o'clock in the morning, we go to a bank robbery in progress. We pull up to the bank. The bank robber has already shot two people inside. He's coming out with the money and he's shooting at us. He's got to go. Me and you light the guy up. Gun in his hand, two shot people in the bank. He, he threw shots at us. We are not going home for at least 24 hours. We're going to be in They're going to take our guns from us. We're going to be interviewed at the precinct. Detectives are going to interview us. Internal affairs are going to interview us. Chiefs are going to show up asking questions. The police commission is getting involved. A district attorney is going to show up with a stenographer and take our statement. They're going to put us on restricted or modified duty to tell us go home. And then within a week, you and I are going to have to testify before a grand jury, which is 16 to 23 people to plead our case. And if that grand jury in unfriendly places like the Bronx or Brooklyn don't like us, don't like our story, they'll vote to indict. We get arrested and we go through the system like everybody else. Wow. I didn't realize it was that sort of hit and miss for you. If you uh, <laughs> That's a good way to put oh. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon the pun. What about um, the kind of, I'm sure every day you come across these, but the biggest asshole you can remember? Is there, there one that's more than I'd like to remember, but I'll tell you a funny story from <laughs> one of my books. I'm sure. Hunts Point section of the Bronx is very industrial. Once those factories close three, four o'clock, it becomes pimps and hoes. HBO did a thing in the 80s called Girls of the Point or Pimps and Hoes or something, but it was an HBO special in the 80s. So when you have pimps and hoes, that brings horny guys that are drunk. So I was in the DUI unit, and I absolutely despise it. That's a story for another day. And BMW goes by, same thing, goes to a stop sign. It was a taillight, I think. Pull the car over, lawyers in the car with a prostitute. And he's just reading me the riot act. You see this car in an impoverished neighborhood. You can think you can shake the trees. And I'm just, he's just abusing me. I'm just standing there. License and registration. Sure, I'll give you my license and registration. He goes, I want your name and shield. He goes, I'm going to file a civilian complaint. I said, okay, give me your information. My partner and I go back to the car. We're laughing. I'm like, this guy has no idea how screwed he is. So I give him the taillight, summons. We walk back to the car. I hand it to him and he goes, this, and he's waving my ticket in my hand. And he goes, this is an abuse of power. I go, I'm going to show you an abuse of power. Step out of the car. So he gets out of the car. My partner takes the prostitute out of the car. I said, my partner is cop my partner is copying down all her information, name, date of birth, pimp, corner, et cetera. I says, go file that civilian complaint. I says, now that I have all your information, because he lived in Scarsdale, which is a nice area. And he had a wedding ring on. I said, I'm going to bring this. You file that complaint. I says, I'm going to call your wife and I'm going to tell her what you were doing down here. And I'm going to provide her a copy of the summons, what you were doing in Hunts Point Avenue at, at 1230 at night. I go, if you're not listed in that phone book, I says, I will find this crackhead and I will drive to your house and have her explain it to your wife. I'm so sorry. Got on his knees. I'm so sorry. It was raining out. I'm so sorry. I'm like, so I guess we understand each other. Yeah. I said, OK, take care. Have fun. Happy motoring. Oh, man, what a story. Yeah, you, you see, like, on, on YouTube, it's quite prominent, isn't it? I didn't appreciate he wasn't a member of law enforcement, but people in who think that they're better than cops, um, particularly even cops themselves at high levels, you see them trying to intimidate policemen after they've been arrested for a DUI or whatever. And that most cops have got cameras on now, haven't they? So they so they record everything that's that's going on. And it's it's interesting to to watch those. Well, you know, it's funny. Everyone thought 
that with cops wearing those body cams was going to show all this police abuse. And what does it show? Opposite. 90% yeah. of it is the opposite of people carrying on like assholes or provoking the cops. Or, you know, cops shooting unarmed people and the camera shows the guy's coming at him with a knife or the guy's coming at him with a gun. Kind of destroyed that narrative. Yeah. Now, don't get yeah. me wrong. There are people that take the job. I see, I've seen it. Cops, that people that take the job that are assholes. And once you give a guy a gun and a badge that's an asshole, they become a bigger asshole. And I'm not a fan of summons cops. Every NYPD precinct has a couple of guys. The, the captains or the supervisors love these guys because they write all the tickets. And they tend to be very antisocial people. They didn't date a girl in school. They got bullied. And the power is in the pen. And these guys would write, run around writing everybody tickets. And then you get phone calls. Like I get a phone call from a guy in another precinct that I knew. Hey, do you know so-and-so? Oh, fuck. What did he do now? He goes, he wrote my brother-in-law a ticket. <laughs> you know, and like, it's like, I wouldn't even talk to this guy because he's going to rat you out. So summons guys were not liked. And there were guys, not summons guys, but were there people there that were like, you know, assholes with the public? Yeah, there, there absolutely were. But if you get too many civilian complaints, that's going to hamper your career because what happens is you're not going to be able to go to a specialized unit because if they think you're a head case... You're just going to stay in a precinct driving around in circles for the rest of your career. Yeah, wow. When you, um, we're talking about hypothetically shooting somebody, did you actually shoot anybody? Oh, no, I was very lucky I didn't have to. Very close a handful of times, but no, thank God. I didn't take the job to take someone's life. No. You know what I mean? That's I, I, I was involved in a lot of things, and I knew that that was a possibility because the more you put, the more you put yourself out there, and the more arrests you make, it's like putting money in a slot machine. Eventually, you're gonna get three sevens, and you know it's on. But um, no, I was very lucky. Very fortunate. I like like part of your book where you um you you highlight the um tension between. NYPD and the FBI. Why, why is that? What, what's the issue there? There's always a rivalry. I mean, I would like to, it's a lot of police departments don't have the resources of the NYPD. Smaller police departments, you know, they don't mind, you know, having them do joint cases. I, I did a lot of joint cases with federal agencies. I did, I was a bit player on a couple of F FBI cases. I just kind of found them to be very secretive and not forthcoming a lot of times whereas you know they, they'd want to know what we were doing but not want to share uh, but i mean i met a lot of nice agents i never had a problem with any of them but there definitely was a rivalry right how is policing different now to when you began or like throughout your career how would you say it's different i think police departments now are very are a lot more customer service friendly whereas Back in my day, it wasn't. But at the same time, nothing irks me more to see cops jumping around in uniform doing TikTok videos and dancing because how are you going to take someone serious if they're jumping around? You know, this isn't vaudeville or, you know, dancing with the stars. You've got a job. Be professional. You know what I mean? People see cops jumping around, acting like a horse's ass in a TikTok video. You take that guy seriously? I went to New York City in 2006. I've only been once. And I remember being flabbergasted that the police actually, like, ate with the public. So you go in, like, a McDonald's or a, I don't know if you have Burger King over there. I think you do. Yeah. You? Burger King or something like that. And then you next table be cops. It blew my mind because I'd never seen anything like that in the UK. I'll tell you a funny story about cops in a restaurant. And this is from, I hate shamelessly plug. It's the opening. Wait, what, I, no, it's not this book. It's um, the NYPD's Flying Circus, Cops, Crime, and Chaos. Here we go. The opening story in that book, and it's a true story. My partner and I are assigned to Penn Station, one of the largest train stations in the United States. And in the lower concourse, we're in uniform. We're taking our break in a coffee shop. And there's people running the trains packed. We're sitting in this coffee shop, having coffee. I look up, and there's an opaque tile above my head with the lighting, and there's a rat, probably about this big, 
and it's going in circles above our heads. And my partner and I are looking at it, and we're taking bets on when the rat's going to die. I go, that thing's dying. So he goes, 10 minutes. I go, five minutes. And we're just watching. And the rat's turning and turning, and the rat dies right above our heads. And we're just enjoying our cup of coffee. And no one's batting an eyelash. Two Indian guys that work there, and I kid you not, come up to our table and don't say a word. Would you like an extra coffee? Can we move you? They show up with a ladder, and the Indian guy goes to the front of the store, pulls over the garbage can and pulls off like the orange top and puts it to the side. One Indian guy goes up the ladder, grabs the tile and shakes it to make sure the rat's dead, right? It was like they had done this before. Takes the tile off, moves it down with the rat, tilts it. The rat slides into the garbage can right at our table, puts the tile back. One guy takes the ladder in the back. The other guy puts the orange top on. Doesn't even change the back. And puts the thing back to the front of the store. And there's people walking by putting garbage in there. I says, what if this fucking thing comes back to life? You know what I mean? And bites somebody. Yeah. But that's New York. That's the opening story if, in that book. And that's a true story. What about if it like shits in people's coffee? or food? That's that's grim. It's not, that's, that's not legal, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> someone should. You know, it's just New York is just so much is going on. I'm someone probably called the board of health. They've probably been violated before, but yeah, that's a true story. Really? My uncle, he was um, a policeman and I, I also, I love all the cops. I love asking them stories. And I asked him, like, would you recommend anybody? Or would he like to join the police nowadays? Would you recommend anyone to join? It? And he's like, hell no. All the checks and balances or the bollocks that he didn't have to go through. If somebody came up and said, or listening to this and said, hey, they come think about being a cop, what would you say to them? We need police. I mean, we, we need people out there. And unfortunately, what's happened to law enforcement because of these politicians and the new and the news media, you're gonna have people, you're gonna, you're not gonna have proactive cops anymore. You're gonna have report takers. You know, cops are making a good salary, they, they've got pension, they've got benefits. They might take their time getting to that robbery in progress or that assault in progress or that shots fired because they're just going to show up and take a report and let the detectives deal with it later. And I mean, that that's terrible for society because, you know, the, the cops are the cops are only minutes away when you need them in seconds. You know, you know, would I take the job now? I, I wouldn't last 10 minutes in today's society the, the way I came up, you know, but yeah, I mean, I. I wouldn't do it, but we need cops. I, I don't, you know, that's a really good question because it's a catch 22 because I don't think I could do it, but we need them. I guess a new generation of cops would be more savvy with some, some of the way thing, things are. And obviously going for, you went through police Academy when they go through every time you say police Academy, watch the videos like, da, 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 da. remember the hated movie, the please. Police Academy. Academy. Hated it because our police. One of my Academy, dad's favorites. I, I did not like our police academy. It's it was six months, and we, I, you quickly realize is the instructors got three or four years on you. They 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 didn't work in busy precincts. They weren't guys that were out there doing the job. It's guys that took the job three years before you. They're studying for the sergeant's exam. They've never gotten their hands dirty, and all they tell you is the when you when you get out there, don't listen to those old timers. Blah 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 blah. And then as soon as you hit the street, the old timers tell you don't listen to those assholes in the police academy. So it's very confusing. But yeah, I guess for for rookie cops or cops going through the academy now, they'll be trained on you know how the way things are, so it'll be more ingrained in them maybe than well they don't know any better. Know, they don't know. Yeah, they don't know any better. Well, one thing I'd love to discuss with you is um, prison reform. Because obviously you must have seen many, and you've mentioned a few of them there, come in, go to jail. You, you nab them, go to jail. Come back on the street, you nab them, go to jail. Do you think prison in the United States is working? No. Do you think it's a good system? <laughs> No, it's not working at all. It, federal laws is at the state levels. You know, you got to give these people something to do and you got to teach them. I, it's, I get, I get, you know, like when I was young man as a cop, I was like, lock them up, throw them away, you know, throw, lock them up, throw away the key. The reality is these people aren't going away forever. 
Some of these people have made a mistake and probably won't reoffend. But if you throw the worst of the worst all together and you don't give them something to do, it just becomes a, a college to become a better criminal. You know, and if you treat people, in, it's the same as you get it. I got a puppy now, just got a, a puppy. If you treat that dog inhumanely, that dog's going to bite people. It's going to be ornery. It's going to do destruction. It's going to do damage. So I'm not saying set up a country club for criminals, but but there's got to be something through vocation and, and teach them things and teach them how to read. And, you know, there's a lot of people in jail that don't know how to read. Can't do basic math, you know, don't have people skills. So when they get out of jail, you know, you're a 35, 40 year old guy. You've been a criminal your whole life. You've been in jail 12, 15, 17 years. The, the, the society has passed you by. You don't know what a debit card is. You don't know how to, you know, you don't know how to put gas in your car. And now you're working for minimum wage with some 20 year old guy bossing you around. It, it's a recipe for disaster. Of course, they're going to go back to the street. It's all they know. So more education, like ref reform, reform. They should make probably. more. Yeah. I mean, you know, incentivize it and, you know, teach them how to read. I mean, the first thing is, I mean, you can't give anybody a bigger complex if they don't know how to read. Right. Yeah. Have you watched, I I'm fascinated by this one, the best Netflix, Netflix series out there. It's called Unblock, a jail experiment. And it's based on a New York, no, sorry, not New York, um, a prison somewhere in the States. L Little Rock in Ar Little Rock, yeah, yeah. Arkansas. And they, they experiment kind of like a Swedish style, but the sheriff. So what he does is he has a unit and he's just opens the doors up and lets them free, free for all sit and see what, actually what happens. I haven't watched the end of it. I'm on the last episode. Have you seen that yet? I have watched the trailer for it. And I, I, I do intend to watch that probably some of it this weekend. It's, it's fascinating. Like I said, I haven't seen the end of it and I don't want to spoil it for you and people watching, but Anyone out there, you've got to watch it. And I'll be interested to hear your thoughts, uh, Vic, when you've actually watched it. Absolutely. On Netflix. Cool. So your life now, how long have you been retired? 17 years. 17 years. Wow. I thought you were going to say three or four. No, no, no. Years. I retired in wow. 2007. Wow. So do you miss it? Do you miss the policing? I miss the action. I miss the camaraderie. I miss going out and looking for arrests. I missed the car. I was in auto crime. I love the action. I love the car chases. You know, I, I love setting up on a stolen car and that, that adrenaline waiting for the guy to get into the car and can we get him out of the car before he takes off? And yeah, I missed that. Retired, retiring from police reminds me a little bit about when boxers retire, when you often hear their stories that they, they go into a kind of deep depression and they can't function in society very well. Did you find that or did you adapt to kind of retired life well? I always keep busy, but I do. Yeah, that, that it, That's a really good question because there's a lot of cops. They retire and they don't know what to do with themselves. A lot of cops go through divorce after they retire because they're working overtime. A lot of cops move out of the city. So they're driving 70 miles each way. They have that 70 mile commute. They're working overtime. They basically see their wife and kids a couple hours at night and on the weekends or when they go on vacation. And then they retire and they're around the house and then they're driving their wives crazy because their wife ran the house for the last 20 years. And now all of a sudden the husband wants to know, why do you keep this here? And why are we going to Costco for this? And it's bad. So I, I think, guys, I, I really think that more cops, especially my job, NYPD guys, because it's the greatest show on earth, should write. Get into writing because it's great therapy. You get to live vicariously through yourself if you miss it that much, which I do. Um, I did not go into depression, but I was certainly bored. I remember like moved down to Florida, got my house set up, and then I was like, and now what? Like I I I quickly realized like this this is not a way to live because the days were just flying by and I wasn't getting anything done. So I mean, I learned I was never handy before because I lived in an apartment. Now I know how to do all these things. I become handy. I was refinishing furniture for a while. I started getting writing these series of books, which I absolutely love doing now, although sometimes it frustrates me. And then I got into podcasting, started the podcast to promote the books. I never saw myself doing this stuff. So, I mean, life's an adventure. It keeps me busy, and I wish more cops would do it. Yeah, well, maybe they will after they've 
they've kind of seen you. What about the podcasting game? How have you found that? Well, I was a guest first on a lot of podcasts. And I, I, I remember like if I had a podcast set up at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'd be pacing. I'd be nervous. I'd have a million and one notes with a million and one stories on either side of me. It was like a newscaster. So if you ask me a question, now I've been doing it so long, you ask me a question, I can go to a story. Like I had no intention of telling that story about the rat coming out yeah. of the ceiling. But once you said that about cops sitting out in a public place having a meal, that just instantly came to me because I'm doing it so often. And um, podcast, uh, as, as a host of a podcast, is a lot more work than being a guest. As a guest, all you got to be is on and be funny or interesting and you know provide good content for your host. Um, as, as, as the host, you got to learn a lot of things. You gotta, you gotta be tech savvy, which I'm not, you gotta know how to record these things. You gotta know how to edit these things. You gotta know how to question your guests without pissing them off or putting them off. You got to work around their schedule. If you really like the person or you really want them as a guest and they cancel, you can't take it personal. Cause if you do, it's going to come out in the interview that you got an edge. Um, it's just a different game, but I, I enjoy it. it. It's learning. Hardest thing for me is the tech. It drives me nuts. I suppose it's great in one sense, because obviously you're in the States, I'm in the UK, and we can do all this. Whereas in the right, right, right. I would have had to have a lot of money <laughs> and then come over and you, you know how it is and do it, do it with you sort of face to face. So where do you see your, where do you see yourself in five, 10 years? What's your plans? In five years, I hope I'm alive and my health is great. I hope I've written five more books because I average about a book a year. I hope I'm making more money writing said books. I hope my podcast takes off. I can make a little bit of money with that. And I want to meet interesting guests and learn things. Yeah. Can't, can't really ask for more than that, can you? Any day above ground is a good day. Yeah, exactly. So just closing off, where can um, people find you? Where can they find your books? Well, before that, I, I want to tell you a story yeah. about the UK's influence on me growing up as a kid. I'll oh, save this it. one for last. So when I was a little boy, right, New York City only had a couple of television stations, but we had PBS, Public Broadcasting System, which would show the English shows. And that was all new to us in the 70s, right? So Benny Hill, I mean, things that you guys oh, probably God, loathe, God. but Benny Hill. Yeah. But Monty Python would come oh, on yeah. Sunday nights at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock every Sunday, right? Now, I'm a child. I'm in middle school. Or, or grammar school. I'm supposed to be in bed by nine. My brother and I are like hovering around the room on it. We had a little portable TV in my room and we didn't know what Monty Python was. It was like a dream. It was like all these crazy skits. and We didn't even know half the shit they were talking about, but it was funny. Like, you know, it's all political humor. We don't know anything about Lord this or Lord Montague or uh, uh, Princess Margaret. We don't know any of this crap, but it's funny. So, my brother and I would do is we would take towels and put them underneath the bottom of the door so my parents wouldn't see the light from the television set, right? And my father would hear us laugh. Like we were crying, holding towels in front of our mouths, trying not to laugh. And my father, you hear him screaming, you better not be listening to those fucking English guys up there. Go to bed. <laughs> so the <laughs> English television shows, and then my parents got into it. Then they started watching our um, – keeping up appearances oh, and yeah. uh, are you being served? And so I grew up with all of that. You know, I have a lot of respect for people in the UK. I love your humor. I love your television shows. And like we were talking, I said, English actors, hands down are the best. They just, the, they take their craft seriously. I mean, they're just great. People can find my books. Just go on Amazon, type in my name, Vic Ferrari, like the car. You can preview all my NYPD books for free. And check out my NYPD Through the Looking Glass podcast. It's on you know Spotify and all those other platforms and YouTube. Yeah, I'll, I'll put the links in the description Thank box. You. John Cleves, who's um, Monty Python, you know, one of the most famous Monty Python characters. He he lives just down the ro road from me, not far at all, bizarrely, in a much posher, posher house and a much posher town, but still. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate your time. It's great to chat with you. Anytime. I'll you come know, back. Let me know. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. And uh, yeah, obviously, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you. Great stuff. All the best. Yeah, listen, it, it, I, I had a great time.